excited. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Romans chapter 9. We're going to pick right back up into it. Uh, Pastor Rustin did a great job. Pastor Case, thank you as well. He did Romans 8 while I was gone. They got all the good material. Like Romans 8, like I'm like sitting there going like, man, I would have loved to have preached through that. Um, like, so I get, I get into chapter 9 now, but, but man, they, they just did a great job with that. The title of today's message is A Heart for the Lost. Um, so what, as we begin chapter 9, um, we are about to see a transition. Um, in, in this letter from, from Paul to the Roman church, he starts the first eight chapters out by spending, spending the entire time discussing the doctrines of justification, of sanctification, of glorification. Um, remember, that's a three-step process. When we become saved, um, when, when we accept Jesus as our, as our Lord and Savior, we are then justified. Um, he justifies us. And then as we walk through our lives with him, as we grow closer to him, we go through this process of sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. And then once we make it into heaven, we, be, we, we get to, glor- to the glorification part where we're glorified, no more pain, no more suffering, a glorified body, no more aches and pains, no more any of that stuff. So Paul really spent the first eight chapters of this letter, uh, and there wasn't chapters back then, it was just one long letter, um, but this first eight chapters going over that part. Well, then he's going to transition, and we'll see as we start chapters 12 through 15 in a few weeks, he goes into to, to really addressing the concerns that were going on in the Roman church. But first, he takes a moment to address God's plan for the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, and that's exactly what he's doing as we pick up in, in verse 9. What I love most about Paul is um, I see his ability to, to perceive questions before they're asked. Like he does it throughout like every book or every letter that he writes, like he just kind of perceives a question and then answers it, like, like as if he's like thinking like the person sitting in the crowd. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Uh, let me tell you. So the question he begins with, um, with, with in chapter 9 is this. What about the Jews? What about the Jews that haven't accepted Jesus? What happens to them? Um, and so let's pick up in Scripture and we'll kind of dive into this. And he says in verse nine, cha- uh, chapter 9, verse 1, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ. For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, in the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So, Paul begins this with, a, uh, with looking at and telling us how, what, how, what, how we should really approach truly caring about the lost. He, he kind of dives into this, uh, uh, and, and you see what he, as he speaks in this, he says, I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness. Paul's like, literally saying, like, I really care about this. Like, and I'm not, I'm not just like, fooling you. And, you know, a lot of times we're like, yeah, I care about the lost. I care about people that don't know Jesus. I care enough to not do anything about it. I care enough, to, like, I, I, I think about them. I, I, oh, bless their hearts. But Paul's like, man, I, I, this, is, this is like, I have anguish in my heart over the lost. I, I, it really hurts me. When, and, and the first point that I want to get through to, to you this morning is this. When you begin to care about the lost, it will change how you interact with the lost. It'll change it. See, a lot of times I, I, and, I and I've been there, and, I, I, and, and a lot of times my heart goes here too. So, so when, I, when I'm like pointing fingers, like, believe me, there's like all, most of them are pointing back at me. Where I'll see somebody that I know, is, that like you can just tell they're lost in their depravity. They're lost in their sin. They totally are missing the mark. And I'll be like, man, look at, geez, God, you should do something about that. Can you believe how, how messed up they are? Oh, man. 
or we, we gnash our teeth at them, we, we, get, we get irritated at them, like, man, I can't believe they would act that way. We get angry when lost people act like lost people. You know? We do. We get, like, absolutely angry. Like, do they not know any better? No, they don't. Honestly, they don't. They don't know Jesus. And if you really take a look back at your life and where you were before you found Jesus, uh, you weren't too far off. But Paul begins to show us, like, when you begin to care about the lost, it'll change how you interact with the lost. See, he says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. See, our conscience should be directly tied to the Holy Spirit. We should be hearing the Holy Spirit. We should be listening to the still small voice in our it's like that when we're like when we're lying or we're not telling the truth or we're or we're fudging things or we're not where we should be where the, the Holy Spirit begins, hey, 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 let's get back on the path. Come back over here. You're about to run into a tree. Come back over here. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself be accursed or cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. When was the last time you cared so much about someone who was lost that you'd be willing to be cut off from Christ yourself in order that they might be saved? You ever thought about it that way? Do I care about the lost so much that I'd be willing to be cut off from Christ myself in order for them to be saved. So often, like, I'm good. <laughs> you need to find Jesus yourself. But the reality of this is Paul's showing us how our heart should be towards the lost, how much it should matter to us that people are, are lost. He's, he's directly worried about the people, his Israelites, his brothers and sisters in Christ. We're Gentiles, so we should be worried about other Gentiles. We should see those who are, 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 are lost in their sin, and like it should bring us anguish. It could, should cause our hearts to hurt for them. We should want to share with them Jesus and, 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 and what Jesus has done in our life. Not stand on a soapbox with a sign saying, repent or you're going to go to hell. No, but actually truly caring about them and showing caring. Because when we begin to care about the lost, it changes how we interact with them. It's amazing what kindness does. It's amazing what time does. I wish that I myself, if I could wish that my myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. We need to be a people that are willing to do whatever it takes, as, as, as Craig Rochelle says, take, do whatever it takes short of breaking the law to reach the lost. Do whatever it takes. That's how much our, heart, our hearts ache for the lost. We look and we see empty seats in our church. That's a, that's, every empty seat represents a lost soul in need of Jesus. We should, we should care for the lost. The second thing he kind of dives in, he, he kind of shifts gears and he begins to talk about the things that they that they are 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 that, that come along with with being uh, uh, the chosen, being the Israelites. And and the, the second thing that we, we need to grab a hold of this morning is this: connection to the things of God is not the same as salvation in the gospel, through the gospel. Connections to the things of God is, are not is not the same as salvation through the gospel. He says, he says this, again, for I wish I, I, that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So there's some things that come along with being a Jew. To them belong adoption and glory and covenant and giving of the law and worship, promises, ancestors, and the Jewish Messiah. There's like these eight things that, that come along with it and everything that are associated with them, yet they, they, they have not taken 
part in it or grabbed a hold of it because they've not accepted the salvation. And so oftentimes, um, I see in people's lives where like they, they're associated with church. They're associated with the things of God, but they never grab a hold of salvation for themselves. They never, never grab a hold of the life-saving uh, work of the Holy Spirit in their life. No, they're associated. They get up and they go to church on Sunday morning. They, 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 come to, they come to meetings and everything, but they have no relationship with God. They haven't, they haven't taken on the adoption. They haven't taken on the glory. They haven't taken on the covenant or the giving of the law. They haven't taken on worship in their own lives. And, the, and, and what, what it does in your spirit when you truly begin to worship God, not just sing songs, but you begin to sing songs as worship under the King of Kings. They haven't grabbed a hold of his, his promises. They haven't joined in with the family of God that, 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 that brings so much joy and, and has so much that. Like I know um, people that like come from generations of, of, of Christianity and, 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 like, and they totally, totally walk away from it. And they haven't grabbed a hold of the Messiah. See, just because you're associated with it doesn't mean that you grabbed a hold of it, that you've allowed it to take part in your life, that you've made it real for you. See, I know a lot of people that know God and know a lot about God, but it is very evident in their life they do not have a relationship with him. What good is it to know verse by verse by verse of the Bible and have it all and know everything there is to know about the Bible and not have a relationship with him. But there's so many people that are out there like that. They don't have a relationship. And the third thing, why would we want anyone to miss out on what we've gained through receiving Christ? Why would we want anyone to miss out on that? Like Hannah said, we've been adopted. We've been adopted. Like because, like, because of Jesus' death on the cross, like, we all, like, what it changed in our life was his ability to have everything that was associated with, with, with Jewish tradition and the Israelite tradition, all of that became ours to grab a hold of, to take part in. And with that comes adoption. See, Ephesians 1, 5 says this, God decided in advance God decided in advance, before you were even born, before you were even a sinner, before you even thought about it, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You think about that. It's not anything that you could have done or I could have done. It's not about works, not about my ability to, to accomplish anything. It was about God want, uh, in advance wanting to adopt me, seeing me, seeing you, where you're at in your depravity. It wasn't like, oh, 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 they got themselves cleaned up. Now I can bring them in. They've met a certain, certain list of check marks. Here's, here's the list of all the things that they've checked off. Now I, can, I, I, I want that one. I mean, the reality is most of us, we were the runt of the litter. We were, the, we were, the, uh, we were, we were like the, 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 the dog at, the, at, the, at, at the, the dog pound with like one leg missing and half an eye gone and ear chopped off and everything. And God's like, I'm going to adopt that one. I'm going to take that one home. I mean, really think about it. I mean, if you look at your life and look at where you came from, what you came out of and everything, like you aren't the, like you're not the shiny little, like cute little poodle in, in, like, like with the tail wagon. Yeah, he chose to adopt you. So when you look at others with their missing leg and their ear chopped off and one eye gone, and, like, and you're like, man, huh, huh, God used to do No, God wants them too. Why would we want someone to miss out on the adoption? And then comes the glory. Romans 8, 17. And since we are his children, okay, now that we've been adopted, we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. 
But if we are to share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Sometimes working out things with the lost leads to some suffering, some uncomfortableness. Sometimes walking in, a, in accordance to God's word means I, I don't always get everything that I think I should get or get treated how I think I should be treated. Sometimes it leads to suffering. Glory leads to suffering. Sometimes I've got to struggle a little bit in order, to, in order for the glory to truly be received. But why would we want to miss out on that? Like so oftentimes we're sitting there, like, God, why, why don't I have it now? I don't care about it now. I want it there. Because what's coming for me in heaven is far greater than anything I could have on this earth. Anything that I could receive here. I, I, I'm a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I have access to the throne room daily. He wants relationship with me. He doesn't want me just to know about him. He doesn't want me just to, 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 to read his word and like, oh, yeah, that's what God did back then. No, he wants me to live it. Sometimes that leads to, sometimes that comes with suffering, but man, the glory that comes out of it, of being a, ch a child of God and then looking forward, because oftentimes we don't look forward to what's coming. I can remember in the 90s when I first got saved, man, almost every song we sang, almost everything we did was all about going home, glory, like heaven, and all this stuff and, and whatnot, and, and, and worship music has changed over the years, and we get into a lot of oceans. And, and, and like I'm in the dundrums, I, like it's like lamenting songs. And I know there was a time in here when, when I was first start, became pastor, I went to the worship team. It's like, no more lamenting songs, none. We need, a, we need to be focused on the glory, on, on what's coming. And what, like we have something to look forward to in heaven. Like, I'm looking forward to, the, to, to God, Jesus coming back. I'm looking forward to heaven. Now, am I ready to go right now? No, but if he said it was time, I'd be, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm having the time of my life. But with God comes glory. And then comes a covenant. A covenant is a contract between him and I. And what's so great about the contract that God has, has, has made between him and I is like he made it pretty much where I can't mess it up. You know, he's like, I did all the work. You just got to receive it. Okay, I'll receive it. And Hebrews 10, 16, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart and I'll write them in their minds. See, that whole having the conscience, Paul talking about my conscience bears witness to it. The law is written on our hearts. Right and wrong is written on our hearts. So oftentimes, we don't want to listen to it because it's not fun. It's not comfortable. It's not what I want to do. But when I allow the Holy Spirit to work in me and to work in my mind and work on my conscience and work on that things, like that all comes to mind, and I'm reminded of the covenant, the contract, the promise that, God's come, that comes with this salvation thing. And I want others to have that same covenant in their life. God sits there like, hey, hey, all you got to do is accept me. Accept my son's, uh, my son's death on the cross. You'll have eternal life. You'll have my presence in your life. I want others to receive that as well. And then, 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 then Paul talks about the promises. The promises that God has. So oftentimes we don't, we're not, we don't connect our minds with the promises of God. 2 Peter 1.4, since I know that I'm putting off my body... Uh, Sorry, since I know that the, the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, as he promised. Putting off, I, I know that like all this stuff, all this stuff, the pain, and as I get older, I'm 41 now, and like the other day, man, my knee just started hurting, like for no reason. No, no, there's some of you guys that are older, but like, there's like these aches and pains that just show up, and I'm like, why, did, why, why, like, never in my life, they're like, well, why is my back hurt? I slept wrong? Like, I didn't lift anything, I just slept weird. It does, but, and, 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 but the reality of this is what Peter says, is like, I know, I know because of Jesus' promise that someday I'm going to put this body off, 
I'm not going to have any pain anymore. I'm not going to have any struggles anymore. I'm not going to have any of that stuff anymore. It's all going to go away because I trust his promise. And then Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. He says, you have not because you ask not. With this covenant, with this adoption, with this connection, being a joint heir with Christ, we have accesses to the promises of God. So often we don't ask. We don't seek. We don't knock. Uh, I'm just not comfortable going there. But what are we missing out on because of it? And what are others missing out on because they don't know about the promises of God? They don't know what he has to offer. And how will they know if no one goes, no one speaks, no one, no one, no one tells them? See, so oftentimes we're good, like with our, 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 our country club, everybody all the same, going to church thing. Like it's, it's hard for us to get into the world and to care about the lost and care about those who need Jesus. But that shouldn't be where our mindset's at. Because what else, the other thing that comes, he talks about ancestry. What comes with, with knowing Jesus as a family and a future. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that, which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. The reality of this is this. Sometimes it gets hard. Sometimes we get worn out. Sometimes we get hit by something and we don't want to go anything anywhere farther. But the reality is there's a host, a heavenly host, a, a, a great cloud of witnesses up there cheering us on. Up there cheering us on. Get up. You can do this. You got this. Keep moving. Keep going. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Because I don't know, there's sometimes you go like, is it worth it? Is it? Is it really worth it? Yes, it's worth it. And as a body of believers, we should be doing the same thing amongst us. Like, get up. You got this. I'm with you. I want to run with you. I got you back. Here we go. Let's do this. You can do this. We should care enough about people that we want to, to, to help them pursue, to grow, and to grab a hold of this family and this future that is in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's saying here as he starts this, this chapter or this, this, this part of the book is, is, look, my heart is anguished. I care. I truly care. And when it comes to us, we should care. We should truly care about the lost. And you're surrounded by them every day. At work, at school, in life, we're surrounded by the lost everywhere we go. What would happen if we all began to start to care? We all began to change the way we acted and reacted around the lost and how we look at the lost. What would happen if we began to truly grab a hold of all eight of these principles um, of, of, of the adoption and really began to walk in that adoption? I'm no longer who I used to be, but I'm, I'm who I am in Christ now. So I'm going to walk like that. I'm going to talk like that. I'm going to act like that. I'm going to quit acting like I used to act. What if we begin to all walk in the promises of God? God, I really care about this person, and I want them to come to know you. Would you help me find a way to reach them for you? God, give me one person today. One person. Put one person in my path that I can share you with. Ask. Seek. Knock. Knock. Because there's a world out there that, we, that, that deserves what we've gotten. They deserve to take part in that. And we should care enough that that, 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 that begins to be part of their lives, what, what they want. But so oftentimes we don't see ourselves as worthy of it. We don't see ourselves having what it takes. We don't see ourselves like, like well, like, I, I'm not a preacher. I, I really don't know a lot of scripture. I really don't know... I, I don't know that I can talk to someone about Jesus. I don't know that I can share my faith with Jesus. Like, how many of you have ever eaten at a really good restaurant? 
Like, and, and, then, and then afterwards, like, you, you just went to everybody and told them how good the food was, right? Like, who doesn't keep that? Like, or you try a dessert, and you're like, man, I had this pie downtown, and it was like the most amazing pie I've ever eaten in my entire life. Man, you really got to go down to, to, to this place and try the pie. Pretty easy, right? It's pretty easy to share when you have a good experience somewhere. We're more, more good at, like, more than anything, we're, we're really good at sharing bad experiences. And we see that all the time. But like when you, when you get a hold of something good, it's really easy to share about it. It's the same way with Jesus. When you're allowing, when you're walking in all those things, all eight of those things, and God is really at work in your life, and God is really doing things in your life and everything, and you're actually having a relationship with him, there's all sorts of stuff for you to talk about. Man, I was struggling the other day, just having a rough time, and, and, and I prayed, and, 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 and I felt God's presence come over me, and I was able to walk through that, and I got through it. I, I, um, this was going on in my life. I was like, you guys, you guys wouldn't believe. Like, my life was so terrible, and then God transformed it. It was amazing. Or I went to church last week, and man, I was really struggling when I got up on Sunday morning. I really didn't want to go and everything, but I walked in, and they sang my favorite song. I don't know how they knew, but they sang my favorite song. Man, and God had just began to speak to me, and then the pastor, he preached his message, and it was good, and like, like you should come check it out. That's how easy it is. Yeah, we make it so hard. Or we make it like, like you're a sinner. And the Bible says that if you don't change your life, you're going to hell. Who wants some of that? Who, who, who wants like, 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 I really do not like it when people come up to me and start telling me my faults. Like, I mean, anybody here like really like enjoy that in life? Or like Michelle, she'll like be like, you left this out on the counter last night and I had to clean up after you again. Like, I don't need that. And then she'll say, I don't need to clean up after you. And she's right. But, um, but this, the reality is this, like, like when we begin to share the good stuff, people want the good stuff. But when you walk into somebody like, look at you, you wretch of a, of a, of a human being. Man, I cannot believe you. I mean, do you know how bad you are? No. So oftentimes we approach it that way. Or we talk about people that way. But that's not how God would have us do it. He would have us have a heart full of anguish for the lost. Have us like truly care about getting someone to a place, not accepting where they're at, not being okay at where they're at, not, not glassing over the sin in their life, but at a place of inviting them to a place where they can come to meet Jesus Christ and they can hand that stuff over to him and grow in him. It's not about staying where you're at, but the, the great thing about Jesus is, is he meets you right where you're at, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And so oftentimes we get stuck, like, like oh, I'm good, I'm good. If I go any farther, that's gonna hurt. Well, sometimes comes suffering to get closer to God. Sometimes I gotta clean up some stuff and allow him to clean up some stuff. He loves you right where you're at, but he loves you too much to leave you there. And then what we need to understand is God's going to meet people right where they're at. We don't have to clean them up. We don't have to get them, get like, we don't have to give them a list of stuff they need to do before they come to church with you on Sunday. We just simply got to get them here. We just simply got to tell them, tell them what he's done in, his, in, in their lives. We made it really easy for you guys. If you have the church center app, you can open it up and you can go like, you can invite a friend. You click on it. You put their name in the text message that pops up, and you can invite them. In, in, in two weeks, we have our Thanksgiving, our annual Thanksgiving meal. Like, it's an opportunity for you to bring your lost friends, your unchurched friends and family to church to eat a meal with us and get to see, like, hey, we're not weird. We're not crazy. We're not out there. We're not a bunch of jerks. We're not staunchy. Like, like you begin to think of all the things that people think about church. They're staunchy, they're arrogant, they're jerks. They're, you know, we're not that. Come have a meal with us. Come check it out. It's fun because church is a lot of fun. That's where you start at. It's real easy because we should care about the lost. We should want them to have what we have. We should want to share it. Like no one, no one like gets excited about the person that like is like only hoards things to themselves. There's this kid in high school that my, my, my daughter talks about all the time and like they always like get 
They sign up for things that are special, that are really cool, and make sure that they only get that, and they get really, really mad when someone else gets to do the same thing that they got to. We don't need to be that kind of Christian. We should want everybody to have what we have. Would you stand with me this morning? Worship team. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness with, my, with the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, for the sake of the lost. for the sake of those who don't know Jesus, for the sake of those who have never heard, for the sake of my coworker, for the sake of my family member, for the sake of that guy that I saw sitting on the corner uh, of Kansas and Maine the other day that I could tell was homeless. It's great to be a part of the family of God. But we should all want others to join that family. This is not something we keep to ourselves. It's not something that we, we reserve just for the people we really, really like. It's something we should want everyone to have. So we're going to sing this song one more time. And I would ask you, the Holy Spirit, right now to begin to speak to each and every one of us. What areas of our life do we need to have a heart change? Or what person in our life do we need to have a heart change towards? We begin to care to begin to care about their eternal destination. The path that they are on. And then what areas in your life are you just associated with but you're not taking part of? The adoption, the glory the covenant, the promises, the ancestry, the family. Some of you guys have an issue with family and connection with others. You kind of just stay to yourselves. You don't want anybody else in your life. One thing about this church, we don't do life alone. We don't do life alone because you will die. You watch any of the Discovery Channel shows. The animal that gets away from the pack is the first one eaten by the lion. So if you think that you're going to be able to do life alone without anybody else, mm, you're probably going to get eaten. Devoured. Satan is a devourer. So what areas are you not taking part in? Are you fully receiving? Are you not connected to? So we take just a few moments as we go into this song one more time to think on those two things. If you need prayer for anything today, be it for healing, something I preached on this morning, or anything at all, we're here for you. Come forward. We'll pray for you. We'll anoint you with oil. But uh, we want to do that. But let's let's sing the song. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer. child of God. I'm no longer, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child
Father, I praise you this morning. God, I thank you for this church, for this people. God, I thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. God, I pray that we truly would accept the fact that we are no longer a slave to fear, but we are children of God, adopted, joint heirs with Christ. God, that, that with that come all the, all the blessings and, and, and promises that you promised to the Israelites, to the Jews. God, we get to take part in that. God, I pray that, that this church would not be full of a bunch of people that are just associated with your promises, associated with the, with the things of God, but God, people that have truly have relationship with you and that they walk out that relationship in their daily lives. God, I pray for all of us to have a heart for the lost. God, for us to truly begin to care for those who don't know you. And God, I pray that you would put someone on each one of our hearts this week that we could pray for, we could share the gospel with. God, we could just love on and share the love that we've received from you. God, let us not be a people that just come in on Sunday morning and walk out not having anything to take out with us. Let us be a people that go, reach, and are your hands and feet everywhere we go. God, we praise you for it. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Y'all have a great week. I love you.